So uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, we're here today to talk about Docker for developers. That's you guys and me. Um, so I'll do a quick introduction to give you just a little context of where I'm approaching this topic from. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat. I work on a product called Satellite and the upstream project Pulp, which is a big part of that uh, product that Red Hat sells. Pulp is um, a Python application. It has a lot of moving parts. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of that detail later. But I found Docker to be a big help to me just in my everyday work as a software engineer. Who's heard of Docker? <laughs> Have you been around this week? Docker's extremely popular. Containers are extremely popular. This is, um, it sounds cheesy, but it really is changing the industry. And it's a revolution that's unfolding right now. I mean, containers, of course, have been around for a while. You guys have probably heard the history story before, so we don't have to rehash it. We're not going to get into those details. Suffice to say, everybody's talking about containers. Everyone's talking about Docker. And throughout that discussion, there's a very distinct theme that I've noticed. The, the end goal of most of those discussions about Docker is production deployment, which is a brilliant idea. It's, it's fascinating. Some of the big boys like Google have been doing this for a, a long time, actually. Um, there's been a lot of talk this week about OpenShift, Kubernetes, a lot of great technology that can help you do this. And it's, it's really fascinating stuff. But it requires a big commitment, a really big commitment uh, from your organization and from your team. The theory of using Docker in production would go approximately like this. You have your development team produces a set of black box containers, essentially. They expose some ports. They have an API. There's some defined contract here. They pass those to some kind of a, your testing team. They test them, maybe pass them on then to whoever deploys your application, and they have their way. So the commitment there is that everybody in that pipeline has to be on board with the idea of using Docker and, and other tools and frameworks to help make that possible and manage that. It's, it's good stuff. But that's, just, that's a big commitment. So we're going to talk about the opposite side of that, that coin today. We're going to talk about, instead of production deployment and all those things, we're going to talk about this. What can one developer with just one laptop by yourself do with Docker just to make your everyday life easier, just to get basic tasks done, regardless of how your application gets deployed? Before we get into examples, I'm going to show you three skills that we need with Docker to really maximize the value there. And I'll, I'll also do just a really quick, I, I bet you guys know a lot about Docker containers already. I won't linger on those basics, but we'll hit it just a touch. OK. In the back, is, is this pretty OK? Cool, very good. All right. So uh, skill zero is approximately what is a Docker container. So let's just, let's just start running one. I like, I like examples. Um, so let's just run one. And a password. And there we're in. There we are. We're in a Docker container now. So what did I just do? OK. We ran Docker. We wanted to run a container. IT says make it interactive and allocate a TTY. RM just says delete this thing as soon as it exits, because I don't want to keep it around. Um, CentOS and CentOS 7, that's the, the name and label, or name and tag of what image we're wanting to run. And bash is the process I want to run inside that container. Pretty straightforward. So what the interesting thing to note here is we can look. Verify we're running CentOS 7.1 with a Fedora 22 kernel. So Docker container is just a process that's running on your machine, on your host machine, that happens to be contained by stuff that we don't have to get into the details of. There's no hypervisor. It's very different than a virtual machine. I'm sure you guys have heard that story before. Any questions? Would anybody would like more clarification on that before we go on? Cool. OK. And anytime, this is going to be an informal talk. Just raise your hand, jump in with questions anytime you want. 
Okay, so we can run our Docker container and exit. It's cleaned up. We can run any process we want here that we would normally run from bash. So we could uh, we can just have it say hi. Uh, we can also do normal shell type things like check exit codes. Pretty slick. So there's a Oh, oh no, how did, how, that's a good question. Crap, okay, thank you. Um, you know, <laughs> Trying real hard, there it is. Okay, that, I think that'll probably do. Okay, so we got a zero, we got a one. We're, we have exit codes. We can work with this. So we can do normal things uh, that we would do in a shell and contain them. Very convenient. OK, let's get into our three skills. I think we're, we're prepared. Skill number one, how do we get files into our container? Let's start by just looking around this container. We have a root file system. And every time we start a new container, it's the same exact root file system that we had when we started the last one. We lose state every time we start, or every time we exit. Anything we've written in the file system is gone unless we do other things. But we're not going to do those things. We love the reset of state. So that's, that's what we're going for today. So how do we get files into this guy? Files like source code, for example. I'm going to take my command and add a dash v which is our bind mount command. I'm going to pick this directory on my host and put a colon and then pick some just name of something. I can make up any name I want here. And there we have it. We have a stuff directory. There's even stuff in it. We can read the stuff and we can write stuff. We can exit our container. Uh, let's see. There we are. So we can read and write files from inside the container very simply by just using this bind mount feature. You can mount um, as many different directories as you want. It's very straightforward. Any questions on that? It's pretty easy. Great. OK, skill number two. This is, this is one of my favorite. Skill number two is linking. We're in a networking world. We want to do stuff with networks. So this container has its own IP address. It has its own virtual Ethernet device. It is sharing the same network stack as the host, because we don't have a hypervisor. We're, we have the same kernel, same network stack. But Docker's done all the hard work for us to give us our own IP address and our own interface. So how can we take advantage of that? All right, what we're going to look at now, we're going to start a service in a container, and then we're going to link to it from another container. So instead of interactive and TTY, we're going to run this as a daemon. And we're going to give it a name. I'm going to pick the name of an actual image now. I think we're ready. OK. Crane. The details are not important. Suffice to say, it's a very small web application that's part of the project I work on. So we're going to use it as an example, because I know it pretty well. OK, so that's running. Let's go back to our CentOS command, and we're going to add a link. And we give it a name. We can, the first side is the actual name of a running container. The second side is we can just make up any name we want it to be inside the container. I tend to stick with the same thing. That was easy. I really ought to show you this. And ah, this is where the wrapping is really ugly, but sorry. Um, so this is showing the list of currently running Docker containers. We can see that we started Crane it, for 40 seconds. And it, it has exposed a port on the right side. You see there, port 80 is exposed and available. And we see the wrapped. It has a name Crane. So we're going to reference that name. 
We've linked it, now what? If you go to the Docker documentation, it directs you, quite a lot of extensive documentation in fact, to environment variables. <clears throat> Docker's injected at the top here, these what, eight, nine, 10, something like that, different environment variables that we can look at to introspect how do we connect to the linked container that we've just linked in. So everything you could possibly need is here. The name is built into the environment variables, the ports there, the IP address. I took one look at this and thought, ah, it's useful, but man, that looks like a pain in the neck to deal with um, in terms of discovery. Like I just, all I really know is that I have a, a container named Crane and I just want to connect to it. How else might we make that easier? What if there is some other way? What if I told you there is some other way, some other system that could help us map a name to an IP address? <laughs> some system that's maybe even been around for decades. Well, uh, turns out I wasn't the only one who had that, who had that thought. Uh, whoops. There we are. Docker has given us a very nice host entry here. So we can just say, forget all the environment variable introspection stuff and you know, how do you parse those? Are we gonna look for regular expressions to tear that apart? I'm a software engineer. I'm trying to make my life easier with Docker. Very simple, very straightforward. Very easy to just link in a container, reference it by name, standard host name. Um, really, really couldn't be hardly easier. Okay, any questions about that? Cool. Um, oh. Oh, we want to actually use it. Let's do that, just for fun. Yay, okay, it works. Anybody recognize that API? The headers kind of give it away a little bit. <laughs> you don't count, You're, he's my boss. <laughs> this, this is actually the Docker registry API. Anyway, that's, that's the world I live in. Okay. And the last skill, this is the third skill, then we're gonna to get to uh, some examples, is sometimes you wanna inject a little bit of runtime data. Um, something that you don't wanna bake into your image, but you, some little setting you want to inject at runtime. We'll see some examples of this, but Docker makes it very easy to use environment variables, just set your own environment variables. So we're just gonna Feeling very creative right now, so we're just gonna do that. And there we have it, down there. Our message is there, and it's high. So it's very easy with Docker to inject your own environment variables at runtime when you start up a container. Any questions? Cool, you guys know it all. Okay, back to where we were. All right, our three skills were, we know how to bind mount files into our running container. We know how to link other containers from a networking standpoint so they can interact with each other. And we know how to inject little bits of data as necessary with environment variables. So let's get into some examples. This is my favorite part of this talk. Unit tests, so we're developers, we, many of us live and die by unit tests. And the interesting thing, the really critical thing about unit tests, they're only valuable when you actually run them. So I'll give you a problem statement that my project certainly faces, and I think a lot of projects face. So you have a large test matrix. What does that mean? So I'll give you an example of the project I work on. It's a big Python app. We have code that has to run in at least three different versions of Python. Three versions of Python, three different major releases of Red Hat Enterprise Linux, a couple versions of CentOS, and we try to do, support a couple versions of Fedora. We support two different message brokers. In theory, someday we may support multiple database backends. How do you test all of that? Oh, and we have a giant pile of optional plugins. So how do you address testing in all these different environments. 
what most people have done and what I've done for a long time and our team has done for a long time is have some kind of automated job that does it for you. You may use Travis. Uh, Travis is um, a free service that's worth looking into if you're not familiar with it. Um, Travis CI, it integrates with GitHub very easily and it will run any set of automated tests or build process, whatever you want, triggered by things like pull requests. Another option is uh, do a homebrew version of that. So Jenkins, Jenkins job that does it maybe for your pull requests, maybe nightly. Um, but the problem there that, that I've encountered is in all of those cases, you don't get to test that full matrix until after you've either submitted a pull request or maybe merged something or maybe actually already done a build. So what if you could test your whole build matrix on your machine as one developer with one laptop? That's the solution. You can make a Docker image for each of those combinations and come real close to simulating that same environment for every different one. You're not going to get all the different kernels, uh, but otherwise you'll get all the different uh, software environments. You can get the different service environments, use your different message brokers and database or whatever else you need. Questions on that? It's fairly straightforward. Um, so let's look at a Docker file that we made to actually do this. This is the only Docker file I'm going to subject you to, um, but we'll just step through it as a quick example so you have the basic ideas of, of how to approach this. If you've never dealt with Docker files before, don't worry too much about the details. The important thing here is that this is essentially a procedural script in Docker's specific format with their syntax uh, defining step by step how do I create a Docker image. So we're going to start from the upstream CentOS 7 image, which we just get for free off of Docker Hub. And I've put some information about who you can blame if you uh, don't like it. Then we install some dependencies. This is a big pile of yum commands. Don't worry about the details. Don't try to read it all. Um, just the point here is here we're installing dependencies for our application that we're testing. Then we do some setup. This is actually an interesting point. I discovered in doing this exercise that Crane will not run correctly unless this directory exists. The unit tests, in fact, won't pass without this directory existing. And I think that's bad. And I didn't discover it until I actually used Docker to create a minimal environment for doing the tests. I discovered this, this limitation. So I want to fix that, but in the meantime, this is where we do it. This is also where you would do steps like building and compiling your application if you're into that sort of thing. And then finally, we set the default command. So where I was running bash uh, or some other process at the end of my Docker run commands, you can just set a default in your Docker file. And in this case, we've set a default command to change in this directory and run a Python command that runs our tests. Notice, how did I get my source code in there? I used bind mount. I used that dash V flag to just mount it into slash code. I could mount it anywhere I want. But uh, this is a very effective. It works very well. And it's enabled us to very quickly and simply, I have a Fedora machine here running a very different environment than our CentOS environment. And I can run both of those tests side by side. I could run them in parallel. Um, it really just opens up a lot of possibilities. Similar is integration tests. Okay, what's an integration test? Just to make sure we're all on the same page. Unit test is very small. One little piece of your application, one function maybe, and just one aspect of that function. Integration test, this is what our quality engineers do, is hit an API endpoint and make sure it responds with the, the correct response, right? So the problem, I'll hit you with the problem statement that we've had with integration tests. Is that they're sometimes it's inconvenient. In our case, we have a separate team of engineers, or quality engineers. They make this suite of automated tests that test our project. They are free to use any tools they want, any language they want, any framework they want. They can really do anything they want. This is a perfect scenario for them to hand us a black box thing that's just easy to run. Before we containerized this, they, they like to use bleeding edge Python libraries, some that aren't packaged for RPM, things that, um, frankly, are a little bit scary to install on my personal laptop or on my, my workstation directly. So it's much happier to put it 
What do you do in a virtual machine is what most of us have done in the past. Putting this into a Docker container in this black box that anybody can just take and run is really just a fantastic solution. So I helped them create a Docker file that goes through just like that last one we saw. Installs their dependencies, um, fetches a couple from some more unique places than just like Apple and, and CentOS, and uh, installs their suite, and then runs it. This was actually an example where I used the environment variable to inject the a, a host name for where does the API live that I want you to test right now. Because I didn't link because I didn't want to limit this to only testing an API that is also deployed in Docker. So in this case, we want this Docker image to be able to test an application that, is, or be a client is really the more generic way to think. We want this container to be a client to any web service anywhere. Just give it a host name. So I injected that host name as an environment variable, ran a little script at the beginning that picks up their whole YAML config file, um, spits that host name out in just the right places and writes it all back out to disk and then runs their test suite. 20 minutes later, we know how we did. Yes, environment variable. <laughs> That's the key. This is a fun one. And I'll tell you, this is as good as the artwork is gonna get because I'm bad at artwork. Um, we had a really interesting scenario that we had to tackle where we have this AMQP message broker in the middle. AMQP, I've, there's been a lot of talk about ActiveMQ this week, I've noticed, which has been very interesting for me. Um, we use the Cupid AMQP broker, which is a similar kind of technology. It's messaging technology. And we have these clients on these two sides that uh, we need to support having clients in remote network segments and even remote physical locations. And the desire was we want to route them all through one connection between these sites. And the Cupid team came up with this very interesting new project called, they call it the Dispatch Router. And I'll save you details of messaging technology, but it's, it sets this story up well that these routers are essentially a pipeline that allow clients on either end to just interact with that one route, a local router endpoint. It's a stateless router that does what's necessary to route that message to some other location. In this case, this broker in the middle. So in proving this out, this all happened very fast. That's how things happen sometime. We needed to test this. We needed to simulate these network topologies with clients in multiple locations and a number of routers linked to each other in different ways, like erector set style. Um, so Docker was a perfect way for us to simulate that on one machine very easily. So we started with, we put the Cupid broker in its own container. Then we made a second container that had this dispatch router. And we could start up as many of those containers as we wanted and link them all on the one side to the AMQP broker and then let Docker actually just assign a random name and ID to those, those routers and use that as our endpoints. And then we came along with these clients and could inject messages at whatever endpoint we want and then go try to retrieve them from some other endpoint and just see what happens. It was just a fantastic way to put out a proof of concept for potentially very complex networking topologies in like 20 minutes. Like literally took about 20 minutes on one person's laptop. Any questions yet? Cool, all right. <clears throat> Here's another really interesting example. Have you ever wanted to simulate load on an API? So in the most basic case, you have some kind of REST API or some kind of a web application that exposes a service. And we're developers, and on my one laptop, I spend all day long running one command at a time, one request at a time, and it all works great. Uh, and then what happens when 10 or 20 or 100 or 1,000 clients come along and start hitting that same service all at the same time? That's when things sometimes, uh, sometimes unexpected things happen. So as a developer, sitting by myself with my one laptop, wouldn't it be nice if I could simulate 
sessions, simulate that kind of load on my API uh, just by myself very easily. So what, what I've done in the past, what many people have done in the past, is very simple things. For example, maybe the simplest is just a curl command with xargs. Just fire up you know, thousands of web requests with curl one after the other for minutes or hours and just see what happens. Uh, that's pretty basic. And that's a good, I mean, that's a fine, robust solution. There are lots of tools and frameworks that can help you with that sort of thing, help you automate it. In this case, there are two uh, interesting scenarios that inspired the use of containers, made it really advantageous. One is that our project has an agent that runs on hosts to manage them. Uh, think of this uh, similar to like a puppet agent running on a host to manage it. Satellite has its own agent that will run and manage an individual machine. It, it would be either very difficult or impossible for me to just instantiate like a hundred of those on my laptop to all try to interact with satellite or pulp at the same time because of the way they get deployed. Very difficult to isolate them. So if only there's some other way I could isolate them. Of course, Docker is a great solution. So we can put we can install that agent instead of having 100 virtual machines to, to do this with, and I have to manage them. You know, virtual machines are, are like kids and pets. You know, you have to take care of them, maintain them over time. They take up a lot of space. So instead of doing that, you can make just one Docker image and instantiate it as many times as you want, 100, 1,000 of them, right on your laptop, very easy. This is where I'll take a, a quick segue, maybe, or a quick diversion into a, a very distinct advantage of containers over virtual machines that many of you probably know. So there's the disk footprint. I don't know about you guys, but when I make a virtual machine, I'm just going to get at least six gigabytes of disk space, maybe 10 just to be safe. I don't know. I don't want to have to think about it and resize it later, so better to go a little more than less. Um, when they're running, you have to, how much RAM do I have to give them? Same thing. I really don't want to run out, so maybe I'll give them a little extra. Then. It's easy to forget about them, especially if we go back to the idea of having a big matrix that you want to test. So you have a virtual machine for all those options. It's a lot of maintenance. And what happens if you get a virtual machine into a state that is a bit unknown or a bit fishy? Well, then you want to rebuild it. We have Vagrant can help us with that and all kinds of tools, but it's all a lot of work. So Docker lets you immediately reset state. It's one of the really key, key points uh, for all of these examples is that Docker lets you fire up 100 of these clients, and if things go wrong, you just kill them all. And they're gone and no problem. When we fire up the next 100, they're all reset immediately back to the same state. And they have a very small on-disk footprint. So why don't we actually look real quick? Because what the heck? Seeing is believing. Let's look at the sizes of some of these images. I, I hope I don't have a big mess of images on here. I probably do. Oh, it's not too bad. All right, so on the right column, you see uh, the size of image. So the biggest one I have is, what, 700-some megabytes. Um, that's, that's our whole application with a whole bunch of stuff in it. But like this uh, CentOS one, let's see, uh, is that even labeled? Sure, it's in there somewhere. We're talking like 250, 300. Oh, yeah, the very bottom. Thank you. Uh, 215 megabytes is all that thing takes to, to keep it on disk. And then when I run it, Docker is going to allocate a little bit of storage on demand while it's running, but that'll all go away. It's very compact, very easy to, to deal with. OK, back to my slide. So back to this example of simulating load. So containers are a, a brilliant way to simulate a lot of sessions and a lot of clients. So this agent, we can install this agent, fire it up, run it. Life is beautiful. Another example from our testing team, actually the CloudForms testing team, very interesting setup that they've done. They're using, so CloudForms is uh, another management product. Um, it's a, there's an upstream and there's a Red Hat product with it. It's a, another management thing that I won't get into the details of, but suffice it to say, it has a web interface. And their testing team was using Selenium to test that interface, as many people do and wanted to do a similar thing to this with the web UI and use Selenium in lots of different sessions to see what happens, see what happens under load. So they actually are running a, they're driving a headless Firefox with Selenium in Docker containers and running their test suite 
like that, running different parts of their test suite in parallel against the same instance, just running the same like stress test uh, 10, 15, 20 times uh, concurrently against their application. It's actually a very impressive setup. This is a great use case for containers. Here's another interesting problem that I've faced, I suspect many of you have faced in the past, is what if you need to reset your database state very quickly? Of course, this is, this is again, we're not talking about production, we're talking about testing. Uh, whether it's me on my laptop where I write some code, I do a little smoke test, I run my script, I try it, see what happens, it explodes, it leaves a mess behind, it's like, oh, I want to clean that up. Or even running integration tests. Uh, maybe you want the ability to segment your integration tests into different <coughs> functional areas of your application and you want to run a suite of tests, reset your state, run another suite of tests, okay, let's reset our state, run another set, Reset our state. <clears throat> so this is our problem. We want to quickly reset our database state. And you know the solution by now is to use a Docker container. So you just start a new container for each one. It's very simple. And you can even bake into your container uh, data if you want pre-populated test data. Like we, you know, we've used, I've used uh, in the past fixtures and database transactions to do this kind of thing. I bet a lot of you have done the same with like Postgres and MySQL to do the same kind of state reset. Docker gives you a new option. Um, for example, our project uses MongoDB. We don't have transactions. <laughs> God, I wish we did. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's another talk. Um, so this gives us the ability to do that kind of, that same effective behavior with MongoDB, but using containers. And this is a really interesting idea that falls in the category of things I've not actually seen with my own eyes, but I've heard tale of people doing this, of actually running your suite of tests and having some very small service or some very small script that keeps a pool of available databases ready to go. And you literally just request a new database for each test or each suite, and you can run them concurrently and just literally line up 10 or 20 or 100 ready to go Docker containers with your database, whatever state's ready to go, and then you can really have low latency access to a brand new fresh database. Any questions or comments? You guys are so civil. <laughs> this is an interesting use case that, uh, that we've found very valuable, is just make a demo of your application. So this is, kind of, this is something that can be challenging depending on what kind of application you have. Uh, if you have a very basic web application like, um, like uh, WordPress, for example, you could maybe fairly straightforward just deploy a public read-only WordPress instance and let people use it, or that kind of thing. Or you may just give a very basic guide, some documentation. How do we go through and uh, very quickly set up just the bare bones basic WordPress and start playing with it? But even, even the most basic of those things can sometimes be a barrier to entry. Have you ever tried to tinker with some new project and something goes wrong and you know it's a little thing but you just can't get past it and you just give up? It's like, ah, you know it's lunchtime or I'm tired, I should have gone to bed three hours ago or whatever. You give up and, and then you, you never actually try out that app. So, if there's a way that you could just hand somebody, for example, a virtual machine image, is something many projects have done for the last several years. Here's a, an image, you can just fire it up, or like an operating system, like you can get a Fedora ISO or a USB drive, you can just boot and just try it out. And that's great. What if you could do the same thing with Docker? It's very easy. <clears throat> the problem that we encountered is this. <laughs> Making Docker images is actually pretty easy, but doing it the right way is actually really hard sometimes. So our application, as the example I know, has a number of pieces. We have a web server that runs in one process. We have a database. We have a message broker. We have 
uh, asynchronous processes that run these, do these long running asynchronous jobs. We have Celery, if anyone's familiar with the Celery framework, it's a great, great Python framework for that sort of thing. We have those different processes. We have another process that's basically like a traffic cop for those tasks, for those long running tasks, sending them to workers. There's a lot of moving pieces that have to fit together. So the problems we face are shared file system, uh, shared configuration items. How do we share secrets? How do we get SSL set up the right way? How do we get the trust set up? Um, it actually gets pretty complex pretty fast. So here's our solution. Just do it wrong. Just do it completely wrong and be very explicit that this is wrong. And so you can go to, uh, to, I don't know if we have it very prominent on our website, but we've, I've blogged about it for our project. Here, you can take this bash script and run this bash script, it'll get these Docker images and it'll stand up pulp for you and all these different processes, it'll link them together and do a little shared storage over here on your host, but it is bad. Do not use this in production. It is insecure, it's unsafe, uh, it's not scalable, it's not robust. Like you don't want anything to do with this first important stuff, but if you just wanna try this thing out, you can in like 10 seconds have the whole thing stood up and running. And this is actually now my default way that I do demos of pulp and that I uh, try to reproduce bugs. Because back to the state reset, I always know I'm getting the same starting state exactly as I got last time. I'm not gonna have some package update ruin my day that broke something or anything else like that. I'm not gonna forget to reset, you know, not that I would ever hack on something or go into the code in my demo and change something to try it and then forget about it and break everything the next day. But if that's ever happened to you, this is a really great way to, to deal with that. So the, the, the skills that we used here from what we learned at the beginning are bind mount to share a file system across your distributed application. It's a very cheap and ef but effective way to do that. Uh, linking your containers together. So we have a little bit of an elaborate um, interconnection with our particular application, but Docker linking just makes it really, really easy. Uh, to essentially imagine drawing on a whiteboard your different, different components and how they link together in a network and just those lines you draw on, on your whiteboard is a link in Docker. It's just it's really simple to deal with. And then environment variables. We use environment variables to inject any little runtime state change that we want to make. Like this time I want to enable this optional plugin or this time I don't want to enable that optional plugin. Um, injecting environment variables is really, really convenient for that sort of thing. Tools. This is, this is a, a, fun, a fun time. This is the creative part of the talk. And this is a, the part of the talk where maybe you guys have some ideas too. Have you ever, have you ever worked on a project that, or an application that sends email? Probably you have. And what have you done to test that? Because it's not easy. Have you put in your config file a real SMTP server and then made a user with your real email address and do stuff and see what happens? Then they go check your work email or check your Gmail account and see if you got the right thing. Probably, I, I've definitely done that. I know a lot of people have done that. I actually have a hilarious story of a coworker at a previous job. He did this and he, he's, he voluntold a couple of his colleagues and used their email addresses too. And some bug in what he had done, he accidentally sent a quarter million emails to each of them instantly. And this poor company was running Exchange at the time. They basically melted this Exchange server. Uh, between Exchange and Outlook, it took over a day to sort the whole thing out. It was a disaster. Um, but, but hilarious. Um, <laughs> you know. So, what if you could have a really simple little tool over here? Like, actually, in the wake of that disaster, one of our other colleagues who's really brilliant, and actually the guy who is the brains behind that testing that CloudForms is doing with Selenium and Firefox, that same guy, um, he's very good at what he does. He made a, he stood up a virtual machine and built out a basic email service for the whole development group to use that would just accept any email sent to it and put it somewhere that was easy to access. And I think he had it arranged um, 
that you could connect with IMAP to look and see what was there. So it was a very nice improvement, so we weren't melting new uh, Exchange servers after that. Uh, and they did move off of Exchange eventually, too. Um, so that's one way you could do it. But then you still have that, that challenge of you have to, well, first you have to build it. And then you have this, this service running that somebody has to maintain and fix if it breaks and all those kinds of things. So this is a perfect use case for a Docker container to stand up a very simple MTA that in a, a bare bones sense, maybe it just writes out each message to disk and puts it in a directory that you know how to go see. And if you want to keep those emails, you could bind mount storage from your local host into that location, and it'll just write those files right to your host's file system. You could get fancier. You could give it an IMAP uh, uh, server for access that way or any other way you want. But the key here is that it's not something you have to have running all the time. It's not a virtual machine that you have to keep that's taking up another 10 gigabytes of hard drive space. And it takes 30 seconds for it to boot. And then you have to run, you have to install 500 updates because it's Fedora and you haven't updated in a week. And all those kinds of problems. With a Docker container, you have just this little, like a tool bag of these little images that are taking up a few hundred megabytes of space. And that's it. And then you just, whenever you need it, fire it up and use it. Here's another interesting idea, is uh, something similar with a log aggregator. You could use a log aggregating service. Um, I occasionally find value in these, um, especially when you have a distributed application you're trying to test and, and debug and diagnose. Proxies are one that we've had uh, a lot of cause to test. Um, how does your application behave behind a proxy? How frequently do you test that? And how difficult is it to test that? Are you an expert in Squid? And are you an expert in Blue Coat? And you're an expert in n number of other proxies that your customer might be running uh, and trying to use between your application and something else important. We definitely face that challenge, if you couldn't tell. So installing those uh, proxies each in a Docker container makes a lot of sense. It's very easy. Once it's there and it's built, I can let somebody else build it even. Um, Probably, probably most of these things are already available on Docker Hub. I'm not even sure. I've built a lot of them myself um, just for personal use. How easy is it to just say Docker run squid and expose this port and give it this name, maybe, and then just start using it? And you know what configuration it is in. You know that the state's going to be the same as the state was the last time you tested it. You know it's reliable. It's, just, it's always there for you. Fake APIs, anybody ever made a fake API um, for some other service that you use? Like, for example, um, I don't know, maybe you access a weather service. So there are lots of weather APIs. Um, instead of accessing live APIs over the internet, much better to access a fake API that you run locally and that simulates the real thing. A Docker container is a great way to package that it's the first time I think I've used that word, actually. But that's a really good way to think about Docker as a packaging format. So it's a great way to package up that fake API and ship that as a web service that anybody can just Docker run this fake API. Boom, here it is. And you can just start using it. You know it's going to be the same every single time. That is all of my ideas <laughs> about this. Um, there are some next steps. Their, Docker is a great getting started guide. I think if you go to their website, the default getting started guide directs you to Mac uh, instructions. I'm not sure why. Um, maybe if, if you're into that, that's good. But you can easily find the link to the Linux getting started guide. Red Hat has um, our Docker registry and our Docker images available. You can go on the customer portal and ask salespeople and that stuff. They know the details of how to get you access to that stuff and what th they can tell you about the future of those things. And then this is a really great example. On Docker Hub, Fedora as a project has done a very good job from very early on, actually, building out a lot of different tools that you can just immediately download and start playing with. Um, all the common databases. So you can Docker run Fedora slash MySQL and Fedora slash Postgres and message brokers and web servers and proxies, all these things. Uh, and even different development environments. So there's a Python development environment, and a Ruby development environment, and a Java development environment, all those things. Uh, lots of great examples, lots of Docker files you can look at for how do, you, 
how do you do those right? They're, they're pretty simple. I know that one was kind of ugly, but they're really pretty simple to interact with. So these are next steps. So at this point, I want your questions and, and also ideas. Do you have ideas of other things that we could do?